Welcome back. If uh, greenhouse gas emissions are not cut drastically by 2030, humanity will have little chance of limiting the impact of climate change. That's the warning by climate and global sustainability experts at the as the world marks Earth Day, they have warned that at the current rate, the Earth is on course for mass extinction, which humans may never survive. They have a call for urgent attention to end the use of fossil fuels. The latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned that even if global warming is limited to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, food production and economic growth will be reduced. The panel further warns that inequality and poverty will increase while environmental diversity will decline and ultimately human disease and death rates will rise. Global warming is mainly driven by greenhouse gas emissions from human activity. Southern Africa is already highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Warm and dry regions are projected to become even warmer and drier with warming in the interior of the regions increasing at twice the global rate. Experts have warned that as average temperatures get hotter, the likelihood of extreme weather events also increases sustainability. Apart from the risks of catastrophic damage to infrastructure, these extreme weather events are associated with diseases like diarrhea, malaria, and even liver and kidney failure. The IPCC report has shown that even if all the policies written by governments across the world to cut carbon emissions had been fully implemented, the world is still warm by 3.2 degrees Celsius this century. They urge greater investment now in climate change mitigation, cutting greenhouse gas emissions in order to reduce global warming which means there will be less need for investment in adaptation measures in the future. Well, let's speak now about some of these al alarming findings and warnings. We're joined by Dr. Yako Folschenk, who is a senior lecturer in strategy and sustainability at Stellenbosch Business School. A very good evening to you, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Now, you make a, a, a very alarming statement by saying humanity is cooking itself, adding more heat to the pot. It's so graphic and jarring. Just tell us what makes you say it like that. Chippy, so we often hear the analogy of the frog in the hot water and the frog eventually cooks itself. Uh, what's ironic about that is the frog actually figures out that it's getting hot and eventually gets out. Um, but it doesn't seem that we're doing that. We, we all every day uh, see in newspapers, we have Earth Day, we've got World Environment Day, we've got Oceans Day, we've got all these days that come up and, and still it doesn't seem that humanity is really able to turn itself around. And I think there are a number of ways that we can describe that. But I would say, you know, it would be really sad for us uh, if in 100 years from now, a few remaining people would look back at us and say, we were the age of stupid. We were the, the, the generation that it could have changed the ship around uh, and, and didn't do anything about it. Um, we've been, in the last 10 years, we've basically spent the carbon budget that's equivalent to what we have left if we want to limit uh, carbon emissions to what we need to reach the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius targets. Um, so it's, it's also almost an insurmountable target that we're setting ourselves. And, and, and we've got very little hope of succeeding unless we really show the political will that has been absent until now. There's political will, but there's also the skeptic uh, who's the ordinary man on the street. Because, I mean, all of these things, some might say a little bit highbrow, scientific, I don't really believe it. But, I mean, if you look at uh, what is happening in KwaZulu-Natal today, we've been told by climatologists that this is as a result of climate change. change and just talk to us. Are, are we seeing hotter and more extreme weather? And this is why you're saying we're cooking ourselves and we just don't seem to be getting the message that the water is hot. Chippy, so I think climate change can be described with two overlapping uh, phenomena. The first one is the, the average temperature that's increase over time, increasing over time. And we could, we could equate that to a straight line, uh, just a line that runs skew upwards and it, it shows ever increasing temperatures. And it's really going to be a long while until that gets so hot that we won't be able to survive. 
although economic growth will take a, a very big hit if, if that continues, what we should be concerned of about is the, the second trend. And, and that's a, we can, we can say it's a little squiggly line that, that's going up and down around that straight line. And the squiggly line is swinging further and further out every year. So what's happening is that we're seeing an ever increasing probability of extreme events. It's not only getting hotter, but the extreme events are increasing exponentially at the moment. And we've seen that, you know, when the, when that line is below the, the average line, uh, we've got Durban, we've got uh, El Nina or La Nina, the, the wet seasons. And then we've got the dry seasons like we've had in Cape Town. And it's, it's, it's on the increase. Now, to the skeptics, I would say, uh, you know, you, you may be right, but you better be right. And can we afford to be wrong about this? And we're not wrong about this. The, the scientific community, there's absolutely zero disagreement in the climate scientific community. And even organizations like the World Economic Forum, the IPCC, these are not organizations that are there to be bunny huggers. I'm not one myself. I'm all for economic growth, but we have to figure out economic growth in a way that we can sustain so that the wealth and the health that we enjoy today can be enjoyed by our future generations and our children. And we'll talk about the IPCC report in just a moment, but I'm just looking behind you. There's a bonsai tree. Not all creatures are made the same, sturdy. It all depends what some may think are natural conditions or optimum for growth. As you say, they don't exist at the moment and there is the danger of extinction, which you say the human race may not survive. Just paint a picture for us. What are we talking about? We have lost um, in the last 50 years. So the, the world um, Earth Day, the one we're celebrating today or commemorating today rather, um, has been celebrating for the lo- celebrated for the last 50 years. In that 50 years, we've doubled the world's population. In that same 50 years, we've tripled the consumption of meat. Um, for meat, we require agricultural land. We require to have deforestation so we can plant soy, and we feed that soy to animals instead of feeding it to people. Um, but because of climate change and habitat destruction, we've we've lost half the world's species already. We have lost 70% in the last 30 years. We've lost 70% of the insect species of the world. We are definitely in a mass extinction as it's happening. It's it's arguable whether humanity will survive as we are. But, you know, I think we need to, to, set it, to put up a fight. We can't just roll over and die. That's not the way the movie should end. And it's interesting that you should say that because there are these little warnings that uh, stay with us for a little bit, like the shortage of uh, tomatoes or the skyrocketing price thereof, of oils, etc. And we forget about it the minute that it seems that there's a return to normality. And this is what is frustrating the UN Secretary General who are saying governments themselves are lying. You spoke about political will earlier on, but just in terms of that um, IPCC report, I see that even if governments were to implement some of the targets that they've played for themselves in terms of cutting carbon emissions, even if they fully implement that, it says that the world would still warm by 3.2 degrees Celsius this century. Why is that? Is it because we're too far gone? Unfortunately, carbon dioxide is a very persistent gas. So there are only a few ways in which carbon dioxide can be taken from the atmosphere. Uh, it's, it's either taken up from by a tree um, in, through photosynthesis, and we've been taking away forests. So we've taken away the lungs of the earth to breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. Um, and the other way in which carbon dioxide can be ab- uh, absorbed is through the sea. So shellfish, for instance, builds its shells with calcium carbonate, which is made from, from carbon dioxide. But we've taken away those and we've, we've taken away the ability of the earth. And if you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere today, it, it stays in the atmosphere for the next 80 plus years. So whatever we emit today is not going to be gone tomorrow unless we implement also technologies that can actually sequestrate like a tree, but sequestrate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Those technologies are not economically viable just yet. You know, for, for us, it's actually, it would be cheaper for us to just stop 
using carbon emits, carbon sources like um, coal and, and fossil fuels today than it is to actually implement um, these carbon sequestration tools. So, and, and even if we do that, it's questionable whether we can do that fast enough and do it, we can do economically and whether we would be able to save the earth in time. You know, what's interesting is uh, even if people, I mean, you spoke about the consumption of meat, how that's more than doubled, and obviously the populations have exploded as well. But even if we change social and human behavior, there are oligarchs who obviously benefit from this. I was watching a documentary about uh, f furniture and how timber is being, you know, obviously is the main source. And forests that are just being plundered irrespective of what laws are in place there are uh, kingpins who ensure that that still happens so how do we police that i mean people can police themselves maybe change their behavior but there are these criminal networks that feed off it literally so i think there are two observations i would like to make here firstly you know, I grew up in a farming community, and if you have a cow stuck in a ditch, there were two ways of getting the cow out of the ditch. You could you could pull on the front, or you could push from the back. And anyone that's been on a farm would know that if you just pull, that cow is too strong; it will never work. Uh, and if you only push, the cow will just turn its head down the ditch again and go. So you need pull and push policies in place. We can con try to convince people to buy the right products, um, and to some extent we can, and to some extent those products um, sometimes come at, at a premium. But you've spoken about the oligarchs, that as long as it's profitable to stay there, nothing will change. So governments need to put directive-based policies in place that, that ban certain things. So we can ban product, uh, cars with a certain fuel consumption. We can even ban uh, internal combustion engines and change over to electric vehicles immediately. Those are things that we can try to do. Yes, immediately is maybe a strong word. But if we don't start acting very, very quickly to this, it will be too late. And it's it's fair to say at a macro level, you know, we're like the dinosaurs. We will, we will, it will be the end and that will be the end of humanity. But if you have children, if you have young children today and you look at them and you can say that, then you're not really human. We should either drastically try to do something about this or we should not have any children in the future. I mean, we hear about it often, the impact on food production, economic growth, um, the growing inequality, rising poverty levels. But we have what we haven't spoken about, and I want us to spend some time on this, that human disease and death rates will ultimately rise. Take us through that. I mean, if that doesn't get through to some people, I think people just are afraid of illness and, uh, you know, dying if it if it's preventable. So uh, what you mentioned is something really interesting. Some of my colleagues working with me have, have monitored what happens with certain diseases. So apart from heart diseases, apart from kidney and liver failure that we see, um, malaria changing its pattern and, and malaria increasing in certain areas due to, to climate change. Um, but for instance, diarrhea is one of the biggest sources of deaths in Africa, and that's not the same in the developed world. So if it's really hot, we see more diarrhea because people are not drinking enough water, they get dehydrated and they've got diarrhea. When it's really wet, they also have diarrhea because then you've got water pollution, etc. And so it's, it's, and that's at a very physical level. But then you start looking at increasing temperatures and people just having, uh, you know, heart diseases, etc. And that also does not into, take into consideration the kind of events that we've seen in Mozambique, the kinds of events that we've now seen in Durban in the past week. Um, the majority of deaths that we will see in the future will be from the poor, and it's going to be from Africa mainly, where we see people dying because of climate change. And we have to face the fact that it's it's not an equal equation. The, the Northern Hemisphere will not ex have the extreme heat that we will have. They might have some extreme weather, but they have the money to invest in in, in weather resilient infrastructure. That's something which we don't have. We've got HIV AIDS, we've got education to invest in. We've got hospitals to invest in. We just don't have enough money to to try and, and fight away the wolves that are from everywhere. So 
we cannot afford climate change. We can choose whether we invest in mitigation, in trying to prevent climate change, or to invest money in adaptation. How do we adapt to climate change? Now, I would bear to say that it's, it would be very difficult for us to actually do something material in Africa about climate change, but that should not stop us. Um, South Africa has got one of the heaviest carbon footprints. And again, it's not even an equal footprint. The the riches of us in, us in Africa or in South Africa, myself, yourself, many of the viewers on this call, we've got carbon footprints equal to the most dirty footprints that you see in America. But we are fortunately equaled out by the poor in South Africa. So we're not seeing an accurate picture, but it's the poor that will suffer the most. It's the rich that has the ability to adapt. If we don't like it here, you can move to Australia or wherever you want. Although I think that's a bad place to move to um, with climate change, but the rich has the ability to adapt, the poor doesn't. And and in many cases, um, it's it's the voices that are not in the negotiation rooms when it needs to be. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. It's a pity we didn't have time to talk about the damage to infrastructure, but much appreciated, Dr. Yako Foshenk, Senior Lecturer in Strategy and Sustainability at the Stellenbosch Business School, speaking to us on this Earth Day. Much appreciated. Moving on.